Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the OK Grognard Show. It is Friday, October 23rd, 2020, 10 a.m. Central, in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Well, it's Friday, and that means it's Building Adventures Day. So we've been knocking off some maps more so than anything else over the last couple of months, I think. So let's have a look at uh, look at something in the DMG building adventures wise. I think last week we did land adventures, so let's continue in that vein and look at adventures in the air. Right. That is a uh, that is a section following land adventures, and then you've got uh, on the water and then underwater. So we'll go through those things as well. We may put those two together. I'm not sure. We'll see what we get through today. Maybe we'll go even further because um, I want to do something fresh, not part of a series, if you will. When we get to that Friday in November when we're at, let's say, the 6th for Game Hole Con. I don't want to be doing the last part of a series for something like that because there'll probably be some people jumping in. It'll be their first time, so I want it to be more of a discreet, on-its-own show. I don't know. It probably doesn't make a whole lot of difference to most people here but that is the thinking so that is the thing um mm -mm -mm -mm. i wonder you should probably do that a little bit i think we've got green screen itis these days i don't know one of these days we're going to get that all squared away and it'll be perfect. Right now, it's a little sloppy, but that's okay. Anyway, that's all the behind the scenes stuff. Let's uh <laughs> let's uh let's get it in the meat of the show and talk about this. Adventures in the air. So I don't, uh, I gotta say, and this is probably true for a lot of DMs, I don't know about all, but probably a lot, not even most maybe, but definitely quite a few, that land adventures tend to be the majority, land including underground, so probably... Probably Adventures in the Air and Adventures Underwater are a lot less. And Adventures even on the water are probably fairly rare relative to land adventures. So a lot of what we're doing here is going over stuff that is not used a lot uh, by me. So it's definitely going to be... Unfamiliar. I've gone over these sections. Hey, Big Dan, how you been? Been over these sections in the past, but I don't use them a lot, so some of this is going to seem rather unfamiliar, even to me. To be able to fly is one of mankind's oldest, strongest fantasies. In the world of AD&D, this wish can often be fulfilled. However, travel and combat in the air is often much different from that which takes place in the two-dimensional realm of the earthbound. So much so that it must have needs... <laughs> so much so that it must needs have a special section devoted to it. And... Let me say up front, too, that I think... Except for the occasional flying spell, which has a limited duration. And maybe somebody has a magic item that allows them to fly, whether it's a cape or a 
carpet wings that you uh, attach. And that doesn't often mean that everybody in the group. Maybe you'll have a group of higher level characters that have mounts like griffins or dragons even. Pegasi. Um, but when you get into not relying on mounts or even a carpet uh, and characters are just flying on their own, it starts to resemble a uh, sort of a superhero genre in a lot of ways to a lot of people. Although it can be said that a lot of mythos outside of Western Europe have uh, flying as a staple of the mythos. So if you're not running a Western European genre type medieval fantasy game uh, using these rules, because you can use these rules for anything, obviously. They have sections on how to use them for science fiction, for uh, American Western genre campaigns. Um, if you're using these for some other mythos besides... Yeah, there we go. Besides Western European, flying may be a lot more prevalent. It might, it might be happening a lot. Maybe not all the time, but it could be something that's just taken for granted. Um, but let's continue on. I just kind of want to say that at the outset. Long distance aerial travel can be accomplished by use of either magical device or flying mount. Certain magic items, such as a broom or a carpet of flying, do not have a limited duration of use and thus are the most efficient forms of such travel. Though a broom of flying may not be very comfortable to use for hours on end. On end. Is that a pun, Gary? Funny stuff. Your players may want to know how far they can go in a day on a flying carpet or other similar device. For the purposes of long distance aerial travel, assume every three inches of speed equals one mile per hour. Thus, a broom of flying with a speed of 30 inches can fly long distances at an average speed of 10 miles per hour and can cover about 100 miles in a day, assuming 10 hours of semi-continuous travel during daylight. But the above formula does not necessarily apply to short-distance travel. If your players are unimpressed by those kinds of distances, Remind them that in a pre-technological civilization, they are little short of miraculous. Some of your players may have walked as far as 20 miles in one day. Ask them to remember how far it was. Gary falls into a little trap of his own here. Um, and this is something that I think a lot of people do you'll see a lot of conversations particularly online but certainly at the game store you'll hear those same kind of conversations where people will be talking about you know what is society like what is a uh, day-to-day life like in the genre that you're playing and people will suggest that what they should be uh picking up on um uh, is that is historical? Um, well, you know, back in the day, they would have had such and such and such and such. Well, the setting might be modeled somewhat on a uh, on a um, medieval Western European civilization. The fact that it has any fantasy in it whatsoever can change the norms in any area that the uh, game master feels 
they want to change within the settings. So be real careful not to discuss a medieval fantasy setting as if it should be uh, automatically uh, in tandem with a actual historical medieval setting. Don't fall into the trap as a player of expecting that from your GM because it could very well be different and you could set yourself up for uh, for failure in certain areas if, uh, if you make those assumptions. So too, um, as a GM, make sure you explain where the differences lie if they're uh, understood enough by the... Uh, by the uh, characters within that setting and they should be understood by them just remember your players don't occupy the skins of their characters 24 7 so things that you believe would be a normal notion for the characters aren't necessarily going to come be second nature to the players so uh, be sure to understand those differences and when those situations crop up where there's some sort of uh, difficulty or failure because of those differences and they weren't properly explained, be transparent about smoothing over that rough patch. Make sure that you say that you understand that they are, aren't those actual characters and their characters would know this even if they didn't and you should have explained it before and then explain it and then move on. Don't waste a lot of time on it. Flying mounts. Most flying mounts will be either griffins, hippogriffs, pegasi. All of these should be very difficult to acquire and even harder to train. None of these types will mix with others. Griffins will eat pegasi or hippogriffs. If given the chance, hippogriffs confined with pegasi will um, bully them whenever possible. Griffins are often nasty and bad-tempered. If captured when very young and trained, however, they can become fiercely loyal mounts. Their loyalty is non-transferable once fixed, and they must be disciplined and trained solely by the intended rider. The griffin must be trained and exercised by its owner on a fairly regular basis while it is a fledgling, up to age six months in order to accustom it to his or her presence and the bridal blanket saddle etc when the griffin is half grown a period of intensive training must begin which will last at least four months the daily routine must never be broken for more than two days or the griffin's wild nature will reassert itself and all progress will be lost after two months of this intensive training it will be possible to begin to fly the griffin. This will be a period of training for mount and owner alike, as the rider must learn how to deal with a new dimension, and he will probably have no teacher but himself. Imagine the confusing tumult of giant wings, the rush of air, the sudden changes in altitude, and you will realize why an inexperienced rider absolutely cannot handle a flying mount. Griffins, like all, like all large flying creatures, eat enormous amounts of food, especially after prolonged aviation. Moreover, they are carnivores and thus very expensive to feed. Care and keeping of a griffin will be a constant strain on the largest treasure hoard. Costs will probably run in the area of 300 to 600 gold pieces per month and will require special quarters, at least three grooms and keepers, and occasionally an entire horse for dinner. So hungry, they could eat a horse. Diet will differ, but similar arrangements must be made for all flying mounts. Uh, you know, I mean, this is all made-up stuff. Uh, you can change the parameters of these things if you wish. Um, they are magical creatures after all. They could have a very specialized diet that requires certain things that do not include horses. 
mythologically, I don't know that there's any basis for some of the specifics in here. So it's up to the GM to make some different some changes if they want. Don't forget that those grooms and keepers will need to be familiar to these mounts. If, uh, if what is true about the rider and mount relationship uh, is to be uh, part of your campaign, then certainly they're going to have to be very familiar too with the grooms and the handlers, keepers, just stands to reason while they might not transfer and you might not have a, a groom or a keeper that can ride that hippogriff like uh, would be uh, the case with horses and whatnot um, being familiar with them at least is, is probably a must hippogriffs are not so difficult to train as griffins, but neither are they as dependable in a pinch. A training process basically similar to that previously described will be necessary, though occasionally an animal trainer can substitute for the master in short periods. So these are, and you know, part of why this is part of the building adventures uh, section is that when adventures take place, in the air, these are considerations. Also, the time it takes to do these things. If you're going to have a campaign that has these aspects, then all of what we're talking about here, the time it takes to do all of these things, I mean, you could hand wave it, but it's probably better that you do one of two things. One, you either build adventures around the capture of the eggs, the upbringing of the creatures, um, kind of uh, that clash between, you know, urban society or civilization and having these monstrous creatures being raised. Uh, if you're Game of Thrones fans, then of course uh, we understand uh, how there were periods of time where uh, Danny's dragons were kind of kept under lock and key almost as if she was ashamed of them or was afraid of what they would do if left uh, if they were allowed to be out and about but of course once they became she became closer to them and uh, keeping them keeping them as a visible threat was uh, you know Kind of that looming overhead, much in the same way her armies were looming over wherever she was and wherever she stayed. Uh, there was a fear factor having these creatures around. And this is something that you can build adventures around in, uh, in your campaign, too. If they're going to spend as much time as it takes, assuming this process we're describing is the process you use in the campaign then either you're going to have to just say, okay, it's a year later, or whatever the time frame is that you dictate, um, and you're just going to have to hand wave past it, or you're going to have to explain what's going on in this time. Maybe there are other pressing concerns in the campaign that don't allow somebody to slip off but for a day or two to take care of certain things. Maybe you're playing a... Uh, or running a campaign um, where the adventures are political intrigue. So that uh, after they spend, after the adventurers spend a certain number of hours a day in hippogriff training or griffin training, they can uh, then go and have their uh, feasts with other politicians and other nobles and other individuals in the... Uh, kingdom and uh, get mixed up in some sort of court intrigue or maybe it's uh, maybe it's not that sort of society maybe it's more tribal in nature maybe they do this in an arena and uh, there's some uh, some spectacle to it that 
people of the community actually are involved in in watching this as it happens. Maybe as you're training your griffin and your hippogriff, you're training others to be ready to do that training to other eggs. Because maybe that is the intention then to create an entire squadron of hippogriff or griffin riders. So the intention is, well, once we get these ones trained, we're going to go get more eggs. Or we're going to breed the ones that we have and create and raise an entire, I don't want to say flock. Flock's probably not the right word, but this can be an entire campaign, a series of adventures you're building that include this sort of a uh, pursuit for the players. Now, of course, this is very specific. Um, This is something that you're going to need... uh, players to buy into um, and players that aren't going to be (laughs) pardon the pun, Gary would love this flighty about it if you've got players that uh, don't stick with a plan in a campaign plan over long periods if they're easily distracted or at some point they become bored I'm not saying you should force them to continue on in this vein but uh, be understanding about it and be ready to switch up maybe they hand over the reins if you will to those trainers and keepers and they let that become a separate thing from the adventurers and they go off and do their own thing and then they come back and check on things perhaps they're funding this school for griffin rider training and uh perhaps something that 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 gets built up aside from the adventurers but under the auspices of them as patrons there's certainly ways out of it if they turn out to be um uninterested in that going forward after you've done it for a while um certainly for adventures like this even if they are completely involved. If you have multiple players, you may have multiple levels of involvement, and so you have to be able to gauge from the different players how much of your game time is going to be focused on this pursuit. So maybe you hand wave chunks of it. Maybe there's some exposition at the beginning of each game session. Okay, you guys have done this, and you've done this, and you've done this, and this is how long it took, and now you have some free time to get out and do some things. You've got to be back by such and such a time or date to continue it. So maybe these rules need to be adjusted when you're building your adventures to accommodate a different level of interest Uh, maybe they're interested in the goal of this, but maybe they're not interested in making this three hours of of game time once a week for months on end uh, around your game table. So you need to accommodate them in a different way. Anyway, building adventures is a tricky thing, and you have to keep in mind all of your players... And then, you know, you may have one who's very much gung-ho about uh, doing all of this in great detail, but you have five other players who, some of whom you're going to lose, um, even if they're uh, kind enough to sit there and be quiet while other people are doing this sort of thing, you'll be able to sense it. You'll be able to tell by the way they're acting, even if they don't vocalize it that uh, this isn't their cup of tea and you need to make some adjustments or lose them or at least not include them, which is something you don't want to do either. All flying mounts must rest one hour for every three hours of flight. They can never fly more than nine hours a day. During rest periods, they will eat as if famished. This means meat for griffins and hippogriffs, and green living plants, preferably of a succulent nature, or fine hay and oats for a pegasi. Use of more exotic types of flying mounts generally requires some form of spell control, such as charm monster. 
though more intelligent, more intelligent ones may possibly give their permission and cooperation in certain circumstances. This does not ensure ease of handling and stability on the part of the writer, however. Likewise, griffins, hippogriffs, and pegasi can be charmed and ridden. To be able to fight while flying, any aerial mount requires considerable practice. To become adept at aerial archery entails at least two months of continual practice. Then it gets into aerial combat. Um, that's less about building adventures and more about running games, so we won't get into that for this. However, it's worth noting that the uh, times that they put on all of this, how long it takes to train and to learn and whatever, it's malleable. I mean, you can uh, you can make some adjustments to those. Obviously, when you're running your own campaign, you could say that certain people are unnatural to it or they're brought up learning these things. If this is part of a society that you regularly... Um, Reg that they are regularly a part of or it's assumed they're a part of at the beginning of such campaign. Um, so it could be that they've had training not yet on a mount, but training to know what to expect. Some sort of a uh, training apparatus uh, with gears and uh, toggles and gimbals. You know, like the three-axis gimbal thing that flies around in all the different directions. That there's a thing inside, and you have to learn how to shoot and stay stay mounted, like like bull riding, right? Uh, maybe nobody ever gets into the rodeo ring, but they've done the bull riding at a uh, at a country and western bar for a while and fancy themselves pretty good at it. Well, obviously, once you get in a real thing it's going to be different but you're going to be better better equipped to handle whatever that is if you've had at least that training over somebody who's never even ridden a mechanical bull so you know there are ways to do some prep ahead of time or to assume some training uh, but that would be pre-adventure and if you're actually dealing with building adventures out of this, you have to consider what's going to happen at the table when the rubber meets the road. So you have to decide which parts of this are going to happen with the group, with the game group at the table, and which ones you're going to assume and have uh, taken care of in an expository manner going in or in between sessions. So make those decisions. Uh, cordon off, uh, write down what stuff you think will be the most interesting, the most action packed. Find out what your players like. Do they, uh, uh, would they enjoy this aspect or that aspect of it? Uh, those are the ones you should probably key on. Um, which stuff are you sure or they are sure they will not enjoy? Uh, maybe do one sort of trial session where you treat all the aspects equally and and play it out, and then at the end you have a frank discussion. What parts of this were boring to you? What parts of this did you enjoy the most? Okay, we'll scale back how much of this we spend time with at the table, and these other things we'll focus on more. So, that's uh, that's the building adventures aspect of this. Uh, I won't get into Arrow Comet, like I said. That's something for a different style, and... Uh, Eh, we'll finish up for the day. So I tell you what, thank you very much for following the channel, if you are, and I appreciate it. Big Dan01, hey there. We'll get you on that list. Uh, whoop, what's that? There we go. That's our big list of... That's our big list of uh, followers who have chimed in on the chat over the course of the week because... We keep track of that every week, and we make sure that when you do, you get on the list. That's the giveaway list. Just our way of making sure that we're not adding robots 
or bots in rather and uh building adventures if you're catching up with this on youtube thank you very much don't forget we'll be here tomorrow with gm reviews we've got rules retrospective on sunday weekly news and announcements on monday cartography and world building on tuesday campaign discussion on wednesday gming tips on thursday back around to building adventures next friday like i say if you're catching up with this on youtube please do subscribe give us a thumbs up on any videos you watch and make comments if you have some constructive criticism to help make the show better we'd very much appreciate it this has been the okay grognard show from beautiful lake geneva wisconsin bye bye